All right. We got people coming in. Welcome, welcome. Please uh, drop in the chat where you are joining us from. Awesome. Hi, Brandon. Yay. Go ahead and drop in there. Where are you joining us from today? We're super excited that you are here. Um, Brian, on your screen, I still see those blight, weird black boxes. Hi from Flagstaff. Hi, Michaela. Oh, John's in there. Welcome, welcome. We are super excited that you're here. We're having a couple of little presentation technical issues right now. Um, Brian, do me a favor and just put your slides one forward or one back. I just want to see if the boxes stay. Yeah, they're two like black boxes that are covering part of the content on our end. Hmm. Um, okay, suggestions? Welcome, welcome. As you are, are joining us from all these amazing places, we have California, we have Galveston, um, we have hometown right here from both Flagstaff and Benson, welcome. Spokane, this is awesome. We already are up to close to 300 people in here. Uh, we're so excited that you're, um, that you're joining us. We're with Dr. Brian Smith today. Um, in thinking about, you know, we're talking about trauma-informed practices and in a time where um, things right now, heightened anxiety, heightened stress are true for not just our students, but for all of us, uh, we would love for you to do a quick check-in, um, a what we call temperature check. So on a scale of one to five, um, one being not great, five being amazing, kind of where are you? Um, and if you're, if you want to share, but you don't have to kind of why, what's creating that? Where are you checking in with us today? Awesome. Nice. Thank you. I'm going to get a pulse for who's in the room and how we are entering the space. Somebody woke up with a crick in their neck. I know I asked in our Facebook educator page today, what's something you need? And the first person that responded was a massage. And I think that's probably true for most of us. Yeah. Um, and so we're hoping that, yay, new job, congratulations. Daily self-care is super important, absolutely. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, anxious about starting the, the new school year. I imagine that that is true for just about uh, everybody <laughs> entering, the, entering the room and having these conversations right now is that we're all a little anxious um, or a lot anxious about starting the school year and um, a lot of the unknown. And, uh, and so we know that our students are also entering um, the situation in that same way. And so how can we then best prepare them and hopefully through some trauma-informed practices uh, we can support each other. Um, I don't know what happened to Brian. Brian, can you hear it? me? Yeah. We have Dr. Brian Smith with us today. At least we did. I'm hoping that we do again. Uh, you can't hear me? Happened. Oh, you can see him and hear him. Sweet. All right. Uh, well, then I'm going to let him run with it because I can't, but that's okay because it doesn't matter if I can or not. So, Brian, take it over. Okay. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, this is uh, uh, obviously a, a really unique time, and um, I think, and especially in some ways appropriate topic, and we're gonna talk a little bit about why. Um, briefly, uh, myself, I worked in schools for many years as both an elementary school prevention specialist and counselor, and as a high school social worker and drug counselor, and I did a lot of mental health work with uh, kids and adolescents as a social worker. Went back to school, 
got my PhD focused on school-based programming, went to work at Committee for Children for a decade, designing the Second Step program. And, you know, primarily my focus has been trying to translate research and science into practice and just be able to figure out how to communicate it so that it really makes sense to people. And so I'm going to try to do that today. This is a obviously very important topic. And um, I think it's important to try to understand it and figure out what we can do about it. Let's see. So here's where we're going. I'm going to talk about adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, um, as well as toxic stress and trauma. Um, after we unpack that a little bit, I'm going to get into what really do I mean? What do I think the science says about what tier one universal trauma-informed practice is with students in, in education? And then focus on some specific strategies that we can try applying with our students. And I want to talk a little bit about this piece of the puzzle because obviously none of the things that I'm going to talk about today just affect students. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of adults have been through this as children. A lot of adults are going through a lot right now, and um, I really want to just say um, for today, pay attention to how you're feeling as we go through this, pay attention to how this is landing with you. This is a very difficult time. And like I said, a lot of people come into this from different places. And, um, you know, if you feel the need, take a break. You're going to be able to watch the recording of this later. I think in general, in this topic of trauma-informed practice, one of the key things is we have to think about self-care. It's like the airlines, put your oxygen mask on first. You know, we have to be able as adults to take care of ourselves if we're going to be able to take care of kids. So just as a little suggestion, really pay attention to yourself, how this is landing with you, how you're feeling. And if you need to, take some deep breaths, take a break, whatever is, is necessary. So first of all, I think that one of the challenging parts for me about doing this presentation is that I'm used to doing presentations like this for people who are in-person schooling. And of course, we don't know. It's probably going to be most places a hybrid model or even fully virtual. And the challenge is really to take the kinds of things that I'm talking about today and be creative about figuring out how to deliver those virtually, how to sort of meet the same needs, provide the same supports in virtual ways. And there's, there aren't a lot of prepared answers because this is also brand new. But as we go through this, obviously keep that in mind. Um, okay. A little more animation than I thought here. I'm, I'm still, so I work with uh, PowerPoint all the time and I'm kind of new to Google Slides. So this is, this is part of that. So I think a lot of us have heard of ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. Um, the, the quick study of that is, or the quick history of that is that um, they did a big study in San Diego because they, they came up with this puzzling finding that people who reported having a lot of these kinds of issues in childhood were having adult health problems, medical, physical health problems. And that in the medical field was, was really a little bit unusual because they normally think that physical problems have physical sources and psychological problems and that these things are separate. But of course, when they actually did the study with a, a, a large sample of kind of white middle class people who were part of the Kaiser Health Plan, I believe, and they surveyed them about all these childhood experiences, they also had all their health data. And so they were able to look at what are the impacts. And um, as you can see, if you look down the list of the things that they came up with as the things they wanted to find out about, the things that they thought were qualifying as ACEs, a lot of it has to do with disruptions in the caregiver's provision of safety for children. So obviously children um, are really dependent on the adults in their lives. And when things go wrong with those adults or with the relationship with those adults, that's where a lot of this comes from. So here's what the research basically said. When they looked at people, um, what they found was that the more of these adverse childhood experiences people had had as children, the more, um, the more serious health problems they had in adulthood. 
um, heart disease, cancer, chronic lung disease, fractures, liver disease. And if you look at these, you can see that actually some of these probably have a lot to do with behavior. So liver disease, for example, one of the main causes of that is drinking, heavy drinking, alcoholism. I think a lot of uh, the mechanisms here are sort of lifestyle related, how people, uh, how people try to cope with the stress of ACEs in ways that end up impacting their health, but also a lot of it, as I'll talk about, has to do with chronic stress. So then the most recent survey was a nationally representative survey. So it really equally kind of captured all, all the different populations. And what they found was, again, that ACEs are incredibly prevalent. I mean, over half of the population has at least one, but a quarter of the population has at least three. And although ACEs are, you know, ubiquitous, people have them in all parts of society, there are groups that have higher levels of ACEs. Black Americans, Hispanic multiracial, um, people who haven't graduated from high school, low income, unemployed, unable to work, obviously that category just jumps tremendously. Um, and identifying as gay or lesbian or bisexual. So there are groups that are at higher risk for ACEs or that have experienced more ACEs. But we also have to keep in mind that it's by no means limited to those groups. It's really something that, that lands across the board. And remember that the initial study that, that, that unearthed these impacts was really white middle class people in Southern California. So I think one of the things that's important to understand is that we oftentimes think of stress and trauma as two completely different things, but they're not. It's really, I think it's more accurate to think of it as a continuum. And at one end is, is manageable stress, and at the other end is stress that ultimately turns into trauma. And a lot of that has to do with whether we perceive ourselves to be powerless, helpless, or lacking control in the face of a significant stressor. Um, this quote comes from an author, Elizabeth Stanley, and a book called Widen the Window. Uh, it is an amazing book. I will warn you, it's dense, but she packs all of the science about stress and trauma, as well as resilience and self-care into this book. And I highly recommend it if you want to do a deep dive into this topic. So the other thing to keep in mind, yeah, yeah. the other thing to keep in mind is that the ACEs list is just a list of things that, you know, 20 some years ago, they came up with and said, well, these seem like things that would have impacts. But there's a lot of other stuff beyond those specific ACEs that can lead to chronic toxic stress and that can impact uh, well-being. And so here's, here's just a brief list. But if you look down this list and think about it, how many of these really involve kids feeling powerless, helpless, and like they don't have agency and they don't have control? I think it's sort of pretty common amongst a lot of these. So what's happening now that could be kind of piling onto this? Obviously, with COVID-19, there's um, school closure that just happened. I know that some of the schools in the Seattle area where I live, they had like a two-day notice. Um, and we don't know what's happening in the fall. We don't know whether what happens when school starts is how it's going to be the rest of the year. That uncertainty obviously affects all of us. It also affects kids. Um, and I think the pandemic shutdown and the closures of school has led to a lot of isolation. And we know that isolation is, is pretty stressful and toxic. And again, this is something kids don't have any control over. Um, kids are also impacted by the massive unemployment and disruption, obviously not equally distributed in Seattle, for example. All of the people who work for Microsoft and Amazon just went and started working from home, whereas a lot of people who are essential workers who can't just not work have been forced to go to the workplace or have simply been, you know, laid off. I mean, there's a huge restaurant industry in Seattle that doesn't exist anymore. Um, this is all stuff that's impacting kids. And who is most affected by this? It's more likely to be lower income people. It's more likely to be kids of color, but obviously not only. Um, and the reality is we don't know, but a lot of our students probably have family members or community members or neighbors that have really been negatively impacted health-wise by COVID. And again, who was most affected by that? It's shocking the extent to which this disease is 
impacting people inequitably in our society. I mean, Latinx and African American people are so dramatically more likely to be suffering the worst effects from this. The other thing is that in the middle of all this, there's been huge nationwide demonstrations, people out in the streets all over the country. And how is that impacting kids? Um, I think one of the things, if you think particularly about African-American students, but for a lot of kids, there's these constant video reminders that, that happened after the George Floyd killing all over the media of basically violence against, in particular, Black people. And for a lot of those kids, that's actually probably at least triggering, if not traumatizing. So again, a lot of what's been going on with COVID-19 and the pandemic and the shutdown and the way that spun out in people's lives involves a lot of powerlessness, helplessness, and lack of control, which is stressful for all of us. And this isn't the presentation where I talk about how do we cope with the COVID shutdown, but this is really part of the picture now with stress, chronic toxic stress, trauma, where do kids lie on that? continuum? It depends. So now what does this mean? We know that a lot of kids are impacted by a lot of different kinds of chronic stress, toxic stress, trauma. It's, it's scary. It's sad. Um, I feel like I'm the bearer of bad news, but at the same time, it's the reality. And it's there and it's happening whether we are educated and aware of it and attuned to it or whether we just think it's not even happening. So I think it's to our benefit and to the benefit of our kids to understand what's going on. And I, would, I, I think it's important to understand also what does it mean? So first of all, does it mean that we should, as educators now, all become trauma detectives? This is one common response. Oh my goodness, I have to figure out what happened to all my kids, which of my kids have been abused and suffered ACEs, which of my kids have been through trauma. I have to now, I have to figure that out. Or maybe like now I have to become a therapist and my job in addition to teaching is I have to start counseling my kids. I have to figure out what happened. I have to talk them through their problems. Or maybe I just have to be the detective who figures out which kids have had this and then refer them to special services. Well, I would say no, that's not the answer. That actually, if you think about um, trauma-informed practice and what we as educators can do at the universal tier one level, what all students can really get provided with that is going to help all students and support students who have been through trauma, it's really about developmental support for learning and growth. And so I'm going to talk about what that looks like. So what is tier one trauma-informed practice? I'd say there's three key ingredients based on the science and the research. And the first is creating, providing for kids a predictable, safe, positive environment. Now, I'm going to walk through each one of these individually. The second one is we have to support the development of self-regulation. Self-regulation, self-control, the ability to manage your emotions, the ability to make good decisions and not sort of react super impulsively to things that you're experiencing. We also need to provide kids with the crucial resource of positive relationships with adults. And in our case, it's mostly about positive relationships with teachers. And the nice thing is that actually this is really important for all kids. So I think the great news here, honestly, is that we don't necessarily at sort of a universal tier one level have to do a lot of specific things targeted at kids who have had trauma, which means which kids are those and figuring all of that out. I think really the great news from the science on this is that primarily the most important thing for us to do to help kids who have had ACEs, who have been through trauma, is really improve the practices that we engage in that we know scientifically support success and thriving for all kids. So one of the things I want to say about resilience is that we have a misconception. We have a misconception that some people, some individual kids are resilient and some aren't. And actually, that's not really accurate. If you, if you, again, if you look at the science, if you really think about what does it mean to be resilient, it's, it's not helpful and not accurate to think about it as something that individuals do or don't possess. And I like this uh, definition from Chris Blodgett 
uh, let's see, I've got the link here. So if you want to read up on this, I think he's kind of the top expert on trauma-informed practice in schools. Uh, he's at Washington State University. He says the resilience is the personal, familial, community, and cultural assets that surround any individual and allow them to continue and grow despite challenges, and in particular, can help protect against or offset exposure to ACEs. So what we're trying to do is boost the resilience of our students who have experienced trauma or ACEs, but we're not trying to do it one student at a time with individualized focused interventions or, or therapy. We're trying to do it by creating the kinds of assets that surround them and support healthy development and growth. So what, what do we mean by predictable, safe, positive environment? So first of all, it in itself is therapeutic. This is a therapeutic thing. Creating these kinds of environments allows students to come to school, all students, particularly those who have experienced trauma, to come to school, to feel safe, to be able to be relaxed, and to be able to de-stress their brains so they're able to develop, focus, and learn in healthy ways. It's what all students need. It's what we all need as adults as well. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna tell you, these weren't meant to all be animated like this. I was trying to figure out how to animate the slides and I couldn't do it, but apparently I did. So um, what's the connection between a predictable, safe, positive environment and um, trauma? So chronic stress and trauma have impact on the brain. Um, a lot of it has to do with essentially especially if you're a child, but in general, if you're exposed to really serious stress where you're powerless and helpless and don't have any control, your brain, because we've developed uh, in order to survive as a species, your brain starts to get tuned towards survival. And that has a lot to do with, okay, I live in a dangerous world. I need to watch out. I need to be on heightened alert for anything that might be dangerous, which means one of the problems with a lot of these kids is that they have a tendency to see more threats even than there are because they're constantly scanning for them. And then they oftentimes have an over response. They oftentimes are the kids who something that seems like it's not a big deal happens and it provokes a big response out of them. And, you know, that's a lot of times because they've kind of gotten wired to err on the side of I'm going to make sure and over rather than under respond. And when all this is happening, it makes it harder to engage in learning. It makes it harder to build new memories and whatnot, because the focus, again, of the brain is really a lot on survival. Unless they find themselves in a safe, predictable, positive environment where they can downregulate the stress response in the brain and start bringing these higher order processes online. So that's the goal here. Another piece of this is, again, this triggering, because if you're someone who's had a, a history of ACEs or a history of trauma, then there's a good chance that as you're scanning for dangers and whatnot, the way the brain works, and okay, I'll tell you a quick story about this. I knew a guy, I know a guy who was in Vietnam, and he came back from Vietnam with a huge load of PTSD from some really intense combat experiences. And Vietnam obviously was a long time ago. This was like two years ago. He was here and visiting in town and he was at my friend's house and they came over to a party that I was at. And when he showed up, he looked a little shook up and I was talking to him and he said, wow, my PTSD is really blowing up right now. He's like 10 years ago, I couldn't have been at this party, but I've, I've learned a lot of skills. I said, what happened? And he said, I was walking out of the house and it was kind of dark and I tripped over something and fell. Now, that's not being in combat. That's not people shooting at you. That's just suddenly something unpredictable happened that seemed dangerous and his brain went on full alert. So there's a lot of different things that can trigger kids. And part of the value of a predictable environment where there's not a lot of surprises and not a lot of sudden changes is that it reduces triggering. Same thing with feeling safe. Same thing with feeling like you're in a positive environment. You don't have to be as on alert. You're not as easily triggered. The other thing is it's possible to re-traumatize kids and we do it too often in schools. And I would say one of the ways that we do it is punitive discipline. Now, why is punitive discipline re-traumatizing? Punitive discipline sort of 
if you think about it, to some extent, it relies on the idea that what kids really need to be experiencing is shame and isolation, and that'll learn them. And actually, for a lot of kids who have been through the kinds of things, for example, if you think about the list of ACEs, the kinds of childhood experiences that really cause trauma, shame and isolation are both traumatic and in the case of kids now who have been through stuff, oftentimes re-traumatizing. So we obviously want to think about how can we avoid this? How can we move away from treating kids in a punitive way? So something that's simple to do in order to create a predictable environment is have a schedule. Now, I think that that's something we can do while we're teaching virtually, let kids know what to expect. In the classroom, what you do is literally, especially elementary schools, you just write out a schedule and make sure kids see and know what's on there so that they know what's coming. That predictability is actually really helpful for a lot of kids. Um, a lot of you may have heard of Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports, or PBIS. Um, PBIS is a way to basically lay out really clear, agreed upon, explicit behavioral expectations for kids that then get reinforced and are part of the school climate and culture, both in the classroom and in the school. And part of the advantage of that is that if you're successfully utilizing a PBIS type approach and kids get on board, then kids know both for themselves, how do I behave in the lunchroom? How do I behave on the playground? But also what can I expect from my peers? And <laughs> okay, also proactive classroom management. There's uh, a method called prompt. And um, I believe I threw the, here's a link in here. Um, Clay Cook is a professor at University of Minnesota who's a colleague and friend of mine and works a lot with Character Strong. He, uh, he's done a lot of work on this prompt method. As you can see, it's an acronym. I'm not gonna go through all the steps, but in general, a proactive approach to classroom management, behavior management, and even just a proactive approach to letting kids know what the expectations are, what's gonna happen, all of that stuff is actually part of trauma-informed practice. Now, if we move on to number two, support for development of self-regulation, what does that mean? Where does that happen? Basically, it's one of the key ingredients in social-emotional learning. And the thing about that, that's the sort of trauma connection is that again, kids who have been through trauma, kids who have experienced a bunch of ACEs, oftentimes um, the priority for them is staying safe and not necessarily how do I manage and sort of downregulate my reactions to things so much as how do I keep myself safe? So these skills, self-regulation skills, sometimes get impacted negatively by trauma. And so by helping boost them, then it helps those kids. And it also helps all other kids, which is why SEL has become really popular and why it's really a big part of tier one practice for all students. So the idea, ideally, I'd say is try to find a high quality SEL curricula. A lot of schools and a lot of teachers and a lot of people now are talking about, well, let's just do it ourselves. We'll just infuse it. We'll just make it up. And a, as a researcher, I have to say there's still no research support for that, that people are really able to effectively do that. But also, teachers are super busy. High quality SEL curricula make it easier. And as someone who has spent years developing programs, I would say that there's a lot of thought that has gone into a good high quality SEL curriculum that figures out the research, how to apply it, how to scale it out, how to weave lessons together. So it's the simpler way to do it. Um, Implement it with fidelity. Well, what does that mean? Basically what that means is if you, if you get a thing and you only do some of it, you're not really doing that thing. So if you are trying to implement an SEL curricula, you can assume that it's been thought through and that really the most likely way it's gonna be effective is if you actually deliver all of it, more or less the way it's been designed to be delivered. There's a lot of research that shows that poorly implemented programs don't work very well. The other thing about social emotional learning and about the development of self-regulation that's 
key is that just going through skills in the classroom, in a lesson, and then leaving it doesn't necessarily get you very far. Uh, it's not that different from academics. If you just kind of get something explained to you, but you don't really get a lot of experience practicing and applying it, then are you going to really become competent? Because the goal with social emotional learning is social emotional competence. And competence basically means you can do something skillfully and well. So we have to figure out how we're going to look at the skills that we're teaching, look at how we're helping kids learn how to self-regulate, and then we're going to develop some common language to cue those kids and to reinforce the use of those behavior skills and strategies in the classroom, on the playground, in the lunchroom, in the hallways, throughout. Um, relationships is number three. And again, here's a quote from Chris Blodgett. Social emotional competence is built through relationships. So one of the things about these three ingredients, the environment, the self-regulation instruction and the relationships is that they're not separate. They all support each other, and interact with each other. And so the reality is that the way kids naturally learn social emotional competence is really through relationships, starting with relationships at home, with trusted caregivers, moving into relationships with school staff. If you're a student and you don't trust or feel comfortable with or feel liked by your teacher or the adults that you're around, it's going to be a lot harder for you to take risks to try new skills. Okay, um, you've probably heard of the marshmallow study. It's super, uh, super well known. It's a classic study that um, theoretically shows that young kids who have more self-control have like better lives, make more money, better careers, everything you can imagine. And what that suggests is that this is all about individual skills. And I think that this is a really nice illumination of the connection between um, relationships and self-regulation. So let's see if I can make this play. If I eat 100 marshmallows, I'll be filled up. Everybody knows that young children, particularly toddlers, two to four year olds, are subject to impulsivity. And it has been thought that that is a characteristic that children are born with. Do you know what? It is snack time now. And so what we wanted to know is whether or not some of these differences between children can be influenced by their own rational thought processes. We wanted to, to manipulate children's beliefs about how reliable the environment that they were in was. We assign kids to one of two conditions, either the, the reliable condition or the unreliable yeah. condition. So for the art supplies that you get to use, you actually have a choice. You can either use these crayons right now, or if you can wait for me to go get some from the other room, you can use our big set of art supplies instead. The kids in the reliable condition, when the experimenter came back into the room, had the, the, the better thing. Um, and for the kids in the unreliable condition, um, the experimenter apologized and said she made a mistake. Um, we didn't have that available and then helped them use the, the first option. Listen, I'm so sorry, but I actually don't have that big set of art supplies I told you about. Sorry about that. But you can still use these ones to make your project. A classic example of a task in which children show impulsivity is what's called the marshmallow task. For your snack, you have a choice. Look what I've got. Marshmallow. <laughs> yeah, so wait just a second, let me explain. So you can either eat this one marshmallow right now, or if you can wait for me to go get it from the other room, you can have two marshmallows instead. I want, I want, two, I want two marshmallows. And what we found, which was an incredibly large effect, the children who were in the unreliable group were more likely to fairly quickly pick up the marshmallow and eat it. So on average, they waited about three minutes. And did you know I did not eat this marshmallow? The children who were in the reliable group waited four times longer. So they waited about 12 minutes, which is an incredibly long time. For, for young children to wait before they get uh, a reward. The difference is maybe due to a different in expectations about what's likely to happen in the world. That's what this experiment was designed to address. Any three-year-old self-control is not necessarily at the top of their <laughs> skill base, but in general, when she sets her mind that she's gonna do something, she's gonna do it. In the marshmallow task, I was like, what you wanna do is you wanna get the most amount of marshmallow possible 
Um, but there may be other considerations. Given that I have this one marshmallow now that's guaranteed, what are the chances that if I wait, there's going to be a second marshmallow later? If it was a teacher he had all the time, that if they would have that trust bond a little bit longer, that he'd probably wait longer. One of the lines of work that evolved as a result of the marshmallow task was to look at the outcomes of children's behavior later in life. But something that's been missing from the equation is this rational process by which children are accessing information in their environment and making decisions about whether they should behave in the short term or behave in the long term. So if they're in an environment in which long-term gain is very rare, well, then it makes perfect sense for them to behave impulsively because that's going to maximize their reward. How's it taste? Mm. A production of the University of Rochester. So, you can see there's all kinds of ways that that applies to kids and not just teeny kids, although I have to say, I, uh, yes, partly put that in because I think we all can use a little cute break once in a while. Um, <laughs> yes, it is snack time. <laughs> I just love that video. So the take home really, though, is that kids have different experiences of the world and they have different experiences of how much they can trust adults and how much they feel like it's worth delaying gratification. And um, it's not just, do you have the individual skill or not? It's something that we have a big impact on. And so providing a predictable environment, providing solid relationships where kids feel like they can trust people has a huge influence on the development of social emotional competence. So what role do relationship play in most ACEs and chronic stress? It's a lack of safety. If you think about every ACE in the list, it's really about a lack of safety. Um, about a lack of predictability, and they typically end up not having a lot of uh, prioritization of developing self-regulation or support around that. And relationships, again, is one of the key ingredients to helping kids develop self-regulation. So this attachment, this kind of resource of having positive relationships is a key ingredient in resilience. Um, what does the research say? Well, the National Research Council and the Institute of Medicine say that positive teacher-student relationships are one of the cheapest and most impactful public health prevention strategies that can be done, not just in schools, but in society in general. Um, what else does the research say about positive teacher-student relationships beyond trauma? They create increased academic engagement, academic and social success, and again, emotional and behavioral development for at-risk students. And ultimately, even though it takes more time to connect with kids, one of the things about this that the research has shown is that there's a trade-off where potentially you actually gain more teaching time and more student engagement. So the amount of time that you may take away from teaching in order to engage in relationship practices typically pays off because the time you do spend teaching, kids are focused, and kids are paying attention and you get more teaching time because there's less disruption that you have to deal with. So how do we go about creating these positive relationships? It's again about intentionally delivering relational practices. And the key is that we're trying to help students feel like they belong and they have a sense of connection. Now, needless to say, this is a different kind of challenge in a virtual schooling world. And I think something that we're gonna have to really pay a lot of attention to, but we are connecting with kids over the internet. And so there's a lot of different ways that we can talk about that. And Houston's gonna sort of touch base on some further supports for this at the end of this, uh, he's with Character Strong. But again, how do we want students to feel in school or, or when they're thinking about school? They want, we want them to feel like I'm known and I belong. This is a place that people know me. This is a place that I belong. And Again, if you think about different kinds of students, some students are more naturally going to feel like, well, of course I belong here, you know, and to be frank, 80% of teachers in this country are white middle class women. Um, so could it be that girls feel a little more naturally like they belong in school, perhaps, but could it feel like, could it be that white students more naturally feel like they belong and that students of color, immigrants, et cetera, 
feel like they're at least wondering, do I belong here? I think these are important things to pay attention to. I matter, obviously. So here's a basic method. This is a, this is a model for relationships. Um, again, developed by Clay Cook. And basically what he says is we should think about it in three stages. Establish, maintain, and restore. Establish is making sure that no kids are falling through the relational cracks, that all of our students get this crucial resource of positive relationships with their teacher, with the adults at school. But once they're established, you can't just assume that that's all it, that's all it is. I've connected and that's it. You have to have ongoing efforts to keep it going. And then eventually something's going to happen and you have to pay attention so that you can repair when there's some kind of a negative interaction, some kind of a bump in the road to get it back to positive and then keep it going. So I don't have time to go into this in depth, but I'm going to run through uh, a few strategies for each. So I don't know how many of you have seen this video of this guy, Barry White Jr., where he, he's a fifth grade teacher in North Carolina, and he actually has a special sort of handshake routine that he does with every one of his kids. It's phenomenal. But one thing I want to point out is that if you watch the videos, or you know, at least the one I watched this morning, there's one student that he doesn't touch. So with all the other kids, he's knocking hands and he's doing bumps and this and that. There's one girl and she just basically does a little hand signal and walks in. And the reality is, for a lot of us, it's not going to be fancy hand, you know, handshakes like he does, but it, it could easily be that we do handshake, we do fist bump now in the COVID times. Is that going to change? I suppose so. But we want to think about essentially what makes kids feel comfortable. We want this to be something that fits for them. Um, the other thing about positive greetings at the door is that as kids are coming in, they're filing past you into the classroom and we want them to have something to do when they get in there. So it's not chaos by the time you walk in the class, give them a simple entry task. And it's also a time to do pre-correction. And I think this part is certainly something that fits the virtual reality of um, as you're going into it, as you're greeting students, you can just remind them of the expectations, remind them of how you think things are going to go. And then the other thing about positive greetings at the door or PGD is that it's good. It's a good strategy for maintaining positive relationships once you have connected with students. So what are some of the impacts at the neurological level? Well, the primary thing is that it increases oxytocin, which is kind of the feel good hormone. And on an emotional level, that promotes a lot of positives, trust and positive mood, decreases anxiety. Socially, it actually pushes, you know, when you have more oxytocin, you as a teacher, them as a student, it kind of helps you collect, connect, it helps you bond. And cognitively, it actually increases social memory. So maybe that's how he's able to remember all those handshakes. But um, there's a lot of positive benefits primarily in the schooling context is that it really activates the prefrontal cortex. Oxytocin sort of charges you up and it sets kids up for better learning by boosting executive function. So that's established. So why are we doing intentional maintenance? Well, the reality is without attention, relationships naturally tend to erode, whether it's with students or colleagues or spouses or family. You can't just, again, make a connection once and assume it's gonna be good forever. And the other thing is that there is, we know in all people, a negativity bias, which is that we tend to pay more attention to negative things that happen. They tend to be a little more front of our mind or a little more powerful than positives. And so it's going to naturally kind of de erode things. So here's the key maintaining strategy, ongoing positive interactions at a dose of five to one of positive to negative also called the magic ratio. We know it increases engagement, reduces problem behavior. This has been researched. Why isn't it one-to-one? -one? Because of the negativity bias. If I have a ratio with you of one-to-one -one negative to positive and, and negative interactions seem to matter more, I'm not really getting the kind of connection I want. There's research on this uh, with, oh, geez, marriages, business teams, and you can see in marriages, it makes a huge difference. In business teams, it makes a huge difference. But look at the educators and the teachers that have strong relationships and low behavior problems are typically found to be at about five to one. It's hard to get to five to one, but four and a half is pretty close. Teachers that have poor relationships and more behavior problems, look at this, 
one positive for every 10 negatives. So this is something that a lot of times we don't necessarily think about. It's worth paying close attention to because it's a way to maintain positive relationships. It also sort of helps you stay on track with kids. So what about this positive environment? What do we do? Um, it doesn't have to be, I'm going to have a five minute conversation with you about your weekend or your sports team or your vacation or your family or whatever. It's, it can obviously just be little things on the fly. And this is going to be true as you're teaching virtually as well. Every smile, every nod, every positive little gesture, every comment, every, I think smile again is one of the key ones. Those all count. Now, once you've established and then you're kind of working to maintain relationships. Can you count on it? No, because things happen. So every relationship has conflicts. We want to catch them early and we want to continue the establish maintain strategies, but we also want to work to restore. This is a simple, uh, one of the many, but a simple restore strategy. And I know Houston's on this. Hopefully he can maybe mention this at the end because there's more PD available through Character Strong for the whole establish maintain restore model. But the basic strategy with the empathy statement is that you want to demonstrate to the kid that you are at least trying to get what their perspective is. And this isn't just traumatized kids. This is all kids. And I want to say it's important to think about this as perspective getting in some ways because you don't actually know what you're trying to do is show them that you're trying to get it. You may not get it right. But also part of this is it seems to me like whatever your guess is, is that right? So now I care, I'm trying to understand, and I'm trying to get it right because you're going to help me get it right. So that's really the message is I care about you. I'm trying to really understand what it's like to be you. And we are at 1048. <laughs> and look, there's a whole slide about equity implementation and empathy training that's coming up. So um, let me back up for a second. Oops. So we ran through ACEs. We talked about um, stress and trauma being on continuum. What are the ingredients that can make stress turn into trauma? We talked about the basic three pillars of trauma-informed practice. Safe, predictable, positive environment. Support for the development of self-regulation and positive relationships with adults. We ran through some strategies for that. And um, again, I think it's going to be a collaborative effort working with colleagues to figure out how to try to apply these to a virtual or a hybrid schooling environment. And my understanding is that we're going to have some questions here in a minute. So I think hopefully that Chris yeah. is going to jump in. <laughs> Brian, thank you so much. It's amazing information. And we do have a few questions that came in. And if you still have questions for Brian, go ahead and drop them in the chat and we'll make sure that he gets them. Um, let's see. One that came in is, uh, what would be some trauma-related tips you'd recommend for me to convey as a school counselor to parents who are having their children remote learning for now? Honestly, you know, the, the three pillars, as it were, uh, they don't just apply to school, you know? So um, one of the simple things, for example, when you think about uh, parenting and, and home life, especially when everything is turned upside down during this COVID pandemic shutdown era is, is there predictability? Is there a schedule? Do kids know what's going to happen? Do they know what the expectations are? It kind of puts a little more pressure on parents to be predictable and to kind of create that safe environment. So I would say that that's part of it. Um, you know, if you have resources to help parents figure out how to, you know, do a little SEL with their kids to support um, the development of self-regulation, self-control, kind of being aware of their emotions, whether it's taking a deep breath or name it to tame it, where you sort of name the feeling so you can engage your thinking brain. Um, Little things like that are important, especially for parents with younger kids. And then, of course, you know, positive relationships. That's a whole parenting challenge in itself, but it's super important. I imagine, too, that um, we can consider the fact that parents are also needing trauma-informed practices right now for themselves. So if we as a school are, are, are having predictable, positive relationships, reliable 
um, communication that it, then it helps them to then be able to support their. Yeah, we may not be trying to help parents directly develop self-regulation, but we should certainly be trying to make things as predictable for them in the chaos of online learning as possible and, you know, give them a sense of connection. So I completely agree with that. And frankly, as a counselor, trying to help parents, one of the big messages is, hey, parents, also, you know, you need to take care of yourself. What are some things that help you relax? What are some ways that you can engage in self-care? I think that's all very important right now. Yeah. Um, all right. We have, what strategies would you suggest I could use to help educators who do not feel comfortable with their skills in social emotional learning? So one of the things that I was sort of trying to communicate through this is that um, on the one hand, I think it's helpful to have some social emotional learning lessons or that other people have developed. And frankly, that's something that we're really busy doing at Care Strong right now uh, is coming up with lessons that can be digitally delivered so that you don't as a teacher have to suddenly become a master of this and make it up yourself. Um, I also think that uh, these strategies are kind of universal. They're kind of basic. Like as a teacher, it should be a fundamental part of your job to figure out how to provide kids with a sense of consistency, a sense of predictability, a sense of uh, clear expectations and, um, you know, positive relationships with kids. That's a human skill that we all need to develop, uh, but it's, it's not rocket science. It's not some strange thing that's just part of SEL. I think really a lot of it has to do with intentionally focusing on it. Nice. And I noticed that Michaela just dropped a link to register tomorrow. We're having 10 practical tools for digital learning that Houston will be um, hosting. And that'll be also some way that we can help and support uh, educators right now. Uh, all right, we have one more. Uh, what are some tips towards transitioning kids back into the classroom with the same sense of structure and being trauma informed when they eventually return to the school building? I mean, the, these are unprecedented times and kids coming back to school, even if they start in person in the fall, how long has it been? Six months for a lot of kids. And, and if it's further into the year, that's a long time that a lot of kids have not been in a structured environment. So part of what I would say is attending to the basics of structure and classroom management and clear expectations and that sort of stuff is going to be dramatically important. Um, I think, um, you know, relationships are super important. Attending to the sort of the social emotional side of what's going on with kids is super important. And I think also, just kind of reintroducing kids to the norms of doing school is going to require a lot of time and focus. And so I think one of the challenges for teachers is that there's going to be a lot of pressure to jump in and get a lot of academic progress made. But I think realistically, there's going to have to be uh, a really big part of this that's about transitioning back to school in a way that helps kids move from the, you know, for a lot of kids, kind of chaos of just being at home doing whatever to actually getting back into a structured environment. And so just that much more attention to kind of classroom management practices, clear expectations, positive reinforcement, proactive classroom management, all that stuff is going to be, I think, critically important. Yeah, that predictable reliability that we talked about earlier. Uh, how often should you revisit um, training on ACEs with your staff? Do you think? You know, there's been a lot more discussion of this um, in the last several years. So I think people are at different places. But when I've gone places to do training, most people seem like they've heard of ACEs. So I think that the issue is less uh, explaining ACEs and more um, talking about, again, what does it mean that so many of our kids have so many different challenges? So, um, you know, I think that there's, uh, there's an old fashioned view of schooling that basically says, hey, normal kids just show up to school and they're ready to learn. And, you know, they're going to pay attention and do their work. And then there's those other kids and I have to identify them and try to refer them to special services or something. The reality is people are really complex and everybody is going through their own reality and their own challenges. And, you know, a lot of kids have ACEs. A lot of kids have other stuff besides ACEs. 
And everybody now has been through who knows what during the course of this pandemic shutdown, crazy time that we're in right now. So I think, I think to me, it's less about emphasizing ACEs and it's more about recognizing that all of our kids are unique and all of our kids need supports beyond simply just delivering instruction and, and that attending to how we create positive environments, attending to how we create positive relationships, doing some SEL, that's all I think these days should be just a basic part of schooling and not some special thing that we try to do for those kids who have had ACEs, whoever they are. Right. And also focusing on assets. You know, too often when we focus solely on ACEs, we're looking at it from a deficit and not looking at all of the things that are assets in every um, in community. And so making sure that we're tapping into that as well. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing is that there's a tendency to think, oh my gosh, those kids with ACEs, you know, they have brain damage or they're just, they're hopelessly, you know, impacted. And the reality is regardless of ACEs, history, trauma, whatever, all kids have strengths, all kids have assets, all kids have a lot of things going for them. And what we're trying to do is provide environments and supports that allow them to flourish regardless. And so, yeah, we don't want to fall into a deficit mindset. And that's partly why it's important to take a kind of universal tier one approach to this. Nice. Well, I think that if we don't have any more questions, I'm going to have Houston. There he is. Look at that. It was like I conjured him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, team. Always so fun to see people's uh, reactions in the chat, people asking about replays and things like that. We will always make sure you get stuff um, after the fact. If you're able to, if you need to step out for a second or you're not able to make the date, just as long as you sign up, we will get those replays. Uh, tomorrow's webinar that Krista alluded to is indeed free. If you can't make the time, just sign up for it. Um, it'll be an awesome review about practical strategies for digital learning. Dr. Brian Smith, uh, always fun listening to you share that um, lens of, of research, which always meets, um, I know, your heart for this work, which you've been doing a long time uh, in a lot of different avenues. So thank you for sharing that and answering the questions that you have. Um, Dr. Brian Smith is one of uh, one of the people on the team, this looks like a roster, like you got a lineup here on the screen um, for our Equity Implementation and Empathy Conference, a brand new conference by Character Strong coming up August 15th and 16th, where we focus on the three things that I think our schools and our world need most critically right now. So each of these people on the screen will get uh, a chunk of time to share from their lens of expertise. And uh, the empathy world, we'll be talking with Dr. Michelle Borba and myself and John. Uh, from an equity perspective, Diana Patton, Aaron Jones, Vincent Perez, Jasmine Wright, and then we have uh, Dr. Clayton Cook and Dr. Brian Smith talking implementation. It's going to be an awesome two days. Um, would love to see you there. And I believe the team has will drop a link um, into the chat so you can register for that. Um, would love to have you there and see you tomorrow on 10 Strategies for Digital Learning. It's going to be a fun one. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Thanks, Krista. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you everybody everyone. for being here. We did drop it in the chat. So please go ahead and register and join us. Have See a wonderful. On the count of three, our famous sign off, Chrissy. You ready? Okay. One, uh -oh. two, three. Make it a great, <laughs> great day. day. Yeah, I, was like, What's <laughs> I don't know it either. Making it up as we go. <laughs> Talk to you soon, Brian. Bye, Krista. Bye. Bye, everyone.